Domlin. And then we have uh, some people tuning into the Zoom in various parts of the world. So welcome to all of you, near and far. My name is Tenzin Amjong, and uh, this weekend I was asked to give uh, a talk on healing disturbing emotions. So it is um, on one level, that's what Buddhism is all about, right? <laughs> All of the Buddhist teachings in one way or another are about to uh, you know, heal uh, the disturbing emotions. Um, but what I've heard from uh, people kind of in charge of running this place, they wanted to have a kind of new spin on things, start to attract some new people to come, get the, get the numbers up. So then we, uh, we do that by combining a little bit of the traditional Buddhist teachings. And then I'm going to also uh, delve into some of the more modern uh, you know, neuroscience, psychology, and so forth, and um, give us a little bit more diverse arsenal with which we can approach our uh, disturbing emotions. But, uh, you yeah. know, since we're rooted in the Buddhist tradition, I thought uh, today uh, we'll start in a, a more traditional way. And then uh, tomorrow we have a, actually a longer session and we can use that time. Um, yeah. Getting a little bit more into the, the more modern stuff. And then I also want to leave a lot of time for your questions uh, because what might be disturbing and the most difficult problems for each of us individually, of course, is going to vary by the individual. And so um, I want to make sure that I'm addressing what's on the top of your mind. Okay. All right. So uh, I see a few new faces. So sir, have you been here before? No. Okay. So welcome. Uh, I met you today. Have I met you before? No, right? I've met you and you brought your friend. So we're gonna give you the referral fee. Daughter. Wow. Okay, great. And then of course on the, uh, on the Zoom, I see a few names that I think I know who they are, but their cameras are off. So, um, yeah, bienvenue. And, uh, oh, now the camera's on or something. I don't know how to say welcome in uh, that language and I don't have my Google Translate. Anyway, welcome to all of you on the Zoom call. So at the beginning, those of you who are new and even those of you who aren't new, then uh, you know that at the beginning of any session, what do we do? We adjust our motivation. Yeah, we adjust our motivation. We ask ourselves and really be clear why we came here today. Yeah, why did we come here today? Yeah, sir, why'd you come? Or you were already raising your hand. Yeah. I was curious. I am, I want to get the presentation. I was curious, it is just very next to my house. <laughs> yes, so he's saying he wanted to practice meditation. He was curious about it, and it's very close to his house. So he just came over. Yes? And you? Um, yes, I do want to connect with the community where I have Okay. So I don't like usually putting the new people on the spot so much, but 
I'll do it anyway. So, so this still is quite, you know, like, oh, I want to meditate. I'm curious. I want to connect with the community. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to connect with the community? Why do you want to uh, meditate? Hmm? Think about that and then think even deeper about that, right? Hmm. So to fast forward a little bit and to maybe nudge you, you see, Here, uh, you know, what the Dharma Lama always is emphasizing is this uh, kind of innate feeling that, uh, well, of course, all humans, but actually all living beings have to want to avoid suffering and want to uh, have some, you know, peace, well-being, happiness, fulfillment, right? And probably you think meditation is going to give that to you. Probably you think connecting with the community <laughs> is going to help you find uh, the, the, the more fundamental inner drive of what we're, we're deeply searching for. Yeah? Maybe. Part of it, yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, when we say healing disturbing emotions, where we're, uh, if we didn't have disturbing emotions and there's nothing to heal, then you wouldn't have shown up to this place, right? So at the very least, we all recognize that there's, hmm, yeah, something that goes on, maybe not all the time, uh, but sometimes our mind does experience uh, dissatisfaction, maybe bouts of uh, anger or irritation or attachment, or I don't know how your mind is, but uh, for sure, since the mind is the sort of lens with which we experience life, then uh, we come to the realization, I think, a mini realization that it's not so much about the external, what happens to us, but rather how our mind reacts to things that is gonna be the uh, sort of more key driver of our happiness and fulfillment and the quality of our life. Mm -hmm. So now at the very least, we're gonna get into this in more detail as we go through the session, but at the very least at the beginning, uh, try to have this in mind that, you know, we're seeking happiness, we're seeking fulfillment, and therefore we want to learn about the techniques, the way to transform our mind to where it currently is, which, yeah, you know, maybe not so bad, but could be better, right? Could be better. And so we want to, you know, come to the session. We want to learn about the techniques by which we can, uh, you know, transform our mind to its current state to uh, you know, more, um, to be more at peace, to have more control of the, the certain emotions. Okay, that's fine. Then, those of you who have a bit more experience, let me talk about these things. Liberation, enlightenment. Well, liberation is just all these disturbing emotions, you know, we're talking about healing disturbing emotions. The, the total health of disturbing emotions is not having them anymore, right? And that's what liberation is. Then enlightenment, even more than that, is to not just dis, uh, abandon the disturbing emotions, but to increase the positive ones, like loving, kindness, compassion, you know, uh, and so forth, to their fullest extent. And why those qualities are needed, it's, well, then when we have our wisdom fully developed, when we have our compassion fully developed, then we'll be in a, a best position to help others do what we're trying to do today, improve our minds, reduce our suffering. Right? So the more qualities we have, the more we can offer others in their uh, sort of quest 
to eliminate their own suffering. Okay, how does that sound? Good? Right? Okay. So try to have that in mind. All right. So now, um, now in general, we're going to get into this in more detail over the next few days. But there are certain, when we talk about the disturbing emotions and, and healing them, well, uh, there are certain practices that are going to be good across the board that are certain like um, foundational practices that's going to help. Just like when we think of health, right? Uh, exercise, eating right, sleep, that's going to be you know, just sort of good building blocks of physical health, right? Then if we have particular ailments, we might have to take, you know, particular medication or do a certain course of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, treatment, but the foundation should be there. So similarly, when we talk about uh, Buddhist practice and transforming the mind, there's also certain building blocks that we want to lay very solid as a foundation for all practices that we're gonna do in the future, okay? And one of them is a uh, formal seated meditation practice, okay? So I want to do that uh, now. And then um, let's see how today goes. Maybe we can do some more before we, we part company tonight. And then tomorrow, we'll also do a few more sessions, okay? So uh, I think everyone, uh, well, no, not everyone. Maybe everyone hasn't uh, meditated before. So let's just start with the, the, the real basics here, okay? So uh, here, if you are in this room, you'll see that you know we have these cushions. And on the cushion, right, we have a big cushion and then we have a smaller cushion, right? That's just under our butts, right? So that's good. We want to have our our tailbone slightly above the knees. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the posture first. Okay, and then we get into a, a kind of straight, already a little bit straight. Yeah, we don't want to be hunched over. So just try to you know sit up straight. And then uh, kind of moving from the bottom up, if you're sitting on the floor on a cushion, Dilshad, are you comfortable like that? Really? That's fine. Okay. So you know how I was saying we have two cushions. We have a big cushion and then a smaller cushion. So one of the people here has abandoned the larger cushion. She's just sitting on the floor, which is a... Uh, I have a cushion uh, okay. All right. Anyway, if you're comfortable, I'm comfortable. Okay. All right. So in any case, moving from the, the, the bottom up, okay, if you can sit in a lotus position, right, that's great. If you can sit in a half lotus position, that's great. If you are comfortable just sitting cross-legged, that's great. So we just want our, our legs to be in a quite stable base, right? Then if you're sitting on a chair, that's also fine. Uh, some of us, you know, the, 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 the knees or other elements of our legs might be difficult to sit on the floor. That's also fine. Uh, and uh, you're doing it great. If you are sitting on a chair, don't be on the back of the chair. Try to come up. So you're supporting your, yourself uh, by your own efforts. And then continuing to come up with the hands, right? Then to have the hands, you're gonna have them on the, the knees like this, that's fine. Oftentimes in the Buddhist tradition, you'll see the Buddhas in what we call the uh, Dharani Mudra, right? So left hand down, right hand on top and in the lap like that, it's okay. Uh, those of you might have studied yoga before, you know this mudra 
on the knees. It's okay. We're not being very particular at this point. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> as we continue to go up, so we straighten our back and then sometimes, you know, the shoulders are quite rounded. So you can just roll them up and back so that your scapula, you know, your shoulder blade is in line with the body. Yeah. This also opens up the chest. We're going to be, you know, breathing. Well, we're going to be breathing in the future. We're not breathing now. We'll start breathing soon. So it's helpful to have a, a, a chest cavity that's nice and open to uh, facilitate the breath. And then uh, we, in the Buddhist tradition, right, just gently tuck the chin in. You feel some elongation in the back of the neck while you do that, okay? This is said to help align the uh, energy channels in the body, which uh, can then help with our concentration. And then uh, normally if you wear specs, you take them off. And then with the eyes, different meditation teachers say different things, but uh, if you can, rather than having the eyes fully closed, then to have them just slightly open enough to allow some light in. Okay, so the mouth is closed. The teeth are not clenched. You can put your tongue on the top of your mouth behind the upper teeth. And just gently press there. Now let's just take a moment and really feel come into our bodies. Our minds are really accustomed to thinking conceptual elaboration, thinking about plans we might have, events that might happen in the future, having memories of the past and reworking them, going over and over again. Just allow your, as they say, the body on the cushion and the mind in the body. Honing in on the sense that you are now sitting, as opposed to walking, lying down, or standing. So you feel the pressure of your body on the cushion below you. So first, we're just observing the body in its natural state. Now, as we observe the body, uh, ask yourself, are there any areas where you are holding some tension, perhaps? So direct your attention to your face, your facial muscles. those muscles around the eyes. Are you squinting a little bit, perhaps? Around the lips, are you pursing your lips? Maybe your forehead, if you're scrunching your brow. Just let all those muscles soften, relax. And going down through the rest of your body, the shoulders, 
many of us hold tension in those muscles, the trapezius muscles. And then work your way down gradually through the rest of your body, identifying any pockets of tension that might be there. And allowing yourself to relax and let go. Okay, and now we're going to stay in our bodies, but now shifting our focus, shifting our attention to the act of breathing. So now as you breathe in and out, you'll notice some changes also occurring in the body, some sensations associated with the breath. So maybe just take a second and ask yourself, how do you know that you're breathing right now? So some of you might feel the abdomen expanding and contracting. Some of you might feel the same thing in the chest, expanding, contracting. Some of you might even feel the sensation of the air as it passes over the skin in the upper lip and nostril area. So wherever it's manifesting most clearly, most vividly for you, just place your mind's attention on that spot and look and see what's going on there. Observe. So we're trying to drop the conceptual commenting. But just you can know when you're breathing in that you're breathing in. When you're breathing out, know that you're breathing out. And then when the, it, the breath switches from an inhalation to an exhalation and vice versa, then you can become aware of those brief moments, that very split second when the inhalation becomes the exhalation. As we do this, if there are other appearances to the mind, maybe the sound, the sound of the cars outside, maybe they're internal, like different thoughts coming up, Memories, items on our to-do list that we have to get to next week. Now, just you can watch them arise, but don't engage. Try not to engage. And just let them dissolve back into the nature of the mind.
for us beginners is also helpful to count the breaths. So at the end of ex each exhalation, count one, inhale, exhale, count two, and so forth. And then when you reach 10, start over again at one. If you notice your mind has gotten distracted and you lose the object, means the breath. Gently without judging yourself. Start over again. Bring your awareness back to the breath. And start the count, start the count one. So we do this for seven more minutes.
Okay, so gently come out of the meditation and bring your awareness back to the room. Okay, so first are um, more, or we should say less experienced meditators or no experienced meditators. Uh, how was that? Did you, were you able to follow the instructions and know what I was trying to guide you to do? Yes? Okay, our friends on Zoom. Okay. All right. So um, what we just did, and I see at least a few of you are also doing the Monday uh, meditation uh, series. Yes? Okay. So Monday, a little bit of advertising. We also, through the center here, we're uh, doing an online uh, kind of Monday meditation. Um, and there's myself and four other teachers that are gradually cycling through, gradually building up and uh, teaching different kinds of meditation technique. It's 45 minutes. And we try to emphasize uh, the practice rather than uh, getting too much into the theory. But, I think it's also a little bit helpful to have a, some knowledge of the theory and a little bit big picture understanding about what we're actually trying to do, right? That might be a question, right? Okay, I, maybe you feel, you feel a little bit more peaceful now? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Then we think, okay, yeah, the, this guy is having us just watch my breath that was nice okay at least i'm not stuck in well the, it's raining now here i'm not stuck in the rain i'm not stuck in traffic um you know my kids aren't uh, bugging me to make them dinner or whatever i've had at least seven minutes of peace but that's not what this is about you know, yes, there's some benefit even to doing that. But um, I'll just say when we were talking about this, this piece of meditation being one of the fundamental building blocks of our kind of, um, as his home is that I don't like to call it mental hygiene, right? We talk about physical hygiene, right? Oral hygiene, brushing, flossing cleaning your tongue, using mouthwash, right? Then we have physical hygiene, washing, exercise, no blue screens right before bed. Then we have the mental hygiene. Um, and here, one thing, one skill that we're trying to cultivate is, um, for lack of a better word, uh, the ability not to freak out, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? So here, uh, what we're trying to do is we rest our awareness on an object. And then when other things try to vie for our attention, we don't chase after them, okay? So, uh, that in itself uh, is a skill that's going to help hone our um, focus 
a concentration, uh, have less of the so-called monkey mind, you know, the monkey mind, like a monkey that jumps from branch to branch. Our mind is also similar to that, jumping from different, you know, one thought to another. Okay, so that's that's good. That's good. If we're able to do that, there'll be more mental peace and just from that. But now, when we look a little bit deeper in how the uh, these disturbing emotions work, how they arise, uh, well, you have to see for yourself. Did any of this happen to you? Where uh, you might you might have a memory come up about uh, you know something that's happened a long time in the past. And then actually, um, it's very interesting in just to share a little bit of my own experience, although your experiences could be very different. But in the, the first a few long-term, or I should say intensive retreats I have, what came up a lot for me was, uh, you know, the people who had mistreated me, right? And you think, oh man, you get that memory. And you think, oh, I should have done that. I should have said that. Oh, I, oh, that would have been a really good, you know, way to teach him a lesson or whatever. Build, builds, builds, builds. Then, uh, you know, a few times, I, I hate to say, but, you know, we'll be honest. Then those thoughts can even a little get violent, right? Uh, fortunately, I only got into a few physical altercations in my life. But, you know, you replay those and you're like, oh, if I had, you know, mm. and then I really, mm, you know, and then that violent, hostile mind, it's arisen. It's strong. Okay. Now, how did this all happen? That one first thought came. Oh, remember when John did that to me? Oh yeah. And then rather than just it's let go in the second moment, we cling on to it. We think more about John. We think more about the situation. We think more about how uh, unjust and what in, uh, I was gonna use another word, but what a not nice person he was. And then the anger comes more full blown and pronounced, okay? So mm, luckily, or I hope many of us, these very strong emotions don't come in a second but they have a crescendo crescendo you know this term okay it's a music term it means getting louder right you notice in music sometimes it's quiet and then it gets louder so our uh negative emotions are like that they start off with a little little thought and then we cling on to it. We add fuel to that fire and then it gets out of control. So by doing this meditation, we're honing the skill, one, that's able to mm, keep the mind on its object. But the flip side of that is <clears throat> when other things come up, we don't engage. We let go. And by doing that, then uh, oftentimes, then the, the kind of little sprouts of disturbing emotions that pop up, they don't turn into, uh, you know, bigger trees 
or actually some of our emotions are normal force fires. <laughs> so, okay. Mm. Now, um, the other thing that um, is happening, uh, kind of more a, a natural um, process as we go through this over a long period of time. Mm, this might also happen. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll share another story. Okay. So when you do a Vipassana retreat, right? Very popular 10 day Vipassana retreat. Uh, so many places here in India do around the world. Then, uh, Oftentimes, one is uh, not allowed to eat in the evening. Okay. Now, some places they allow you one piece of fruit. Other places, nada. Nada. Nada is a Spanish word. It means chunya, nothing. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. You with me? So you've had lunch. You don't eat anything until the next morning. So you've never done this before. You're not into intermittent fasting, okay? What happens in your late night meditation session? Grumbling, you know, growling the stomach. So hungry. You've gotten all these beautiful instructions, maintain focus on the breath, you know, but all there is, is this overwhelming sense of hunger. Okay. But you can't eat. You can't eat. So what do you do? What do you do? Okay. So there's two things. You can either, when you focus on that, that feeling of hunger, okay? The same kind of thing, right? It's just a feeling. The feeling, all right. But we add this conceptual overlay, the commentary, right? Hungry. Oh my gosh. Why do they have this stupid rule that I can't eat in the evening? Ah, ah, can I? I should have sn uh, snuck some snacks in or something. Ah, oh, I can't believe. Ah, oh, what is this? You know, then the mind commenting, commenting, the experience getting more and more unbearable. Hmm? Hmm. Or sometimes. This happened, right? You can watch, watch, watch the hunger, watch the sensation. All of a sudden, you know, you're hungry at 7.30, 7.45, you're fine again. And you didn't eat. I'm not seeing the light bulbs go off. Okay. You have to understand how the mind usually is working, right? We have a desire for food. You fill in the blank, right? So this is the thing. We learn it on, on one, right? We learn it with respect to one object of attachment, one object of desire. And then same thing. It can apply to anything, right? So here, the food. We didn't have food. Normally, what happens? We don't have food. We get hungry. There's that, that feeling. Most of the time, we just go to the cupboard, get the laced potato chips or the chocolate bar, whatever you like. And we fulfill the desire. We're no longer hungry. <sighs> okay. That's the alleviation of suffering. Right? Remember what I was saying? 
at the beginning, everything we do is to alleviate suffering, right? Our fundamental drive. So most of the time, we have that suffering of not having food. We get the food to alleviate the suffering. Now, we put ourselves in an environment. We don't, we don't have that option. There's no cupboard. There's no Swiggy or Uber Eats or whatever you like. Then, I hope you all have this. Experience yourself in the meditation where there's the desire that goes away without you having to have the object of desire. Huh? Okay. Then, this might have been, yeah, anyway. One of, one of the, the, the biggest things I learned in those early Vipassana uh, retreats I took, that there's nothing to do sometimes. Yeah. Even if you don't do anything, the affliction will go away on its own. Okay. Now, those of you who have uh, been a bit more in the philosophical classes, right? Then you'll know this concept, impermanence, so prevalent, so famous within Buddhism, right? Impermanence, oh, everything's impermanent. So yeah, we talk about impermanence, you know, things change, things die. But the gross level of impermanence is, you know, we have a cup, uh, nice cup. It falls down, <laughs> it shatters on the floor. Impermanence, right? Or a family member or, you know, someone you know, dies. Impermanence on a very gross level. This gross level of impermanence basically is the continuum, <laughs> the continuum of an object that then gets severed through an external force, smashing the cup or, you know, the person dying, so forth. But you see, the more subtle level of impermanence is that things are changing all the time without and an external force intervening, you know, things of their nature, whatever is born will die, whatever, you know, um, whatever is collected will disperse, yeah, all meetings and in separation, all these things, right, so on a more fundamental level, when we have that desire come up, what impermanence means is that desire is going to go away. Why? Because the desire arose in the first place. Do you understand? Thank you for your honesty. We have one, everyone. Many people, so a few people like this. Many people just, you know, no shaking of the head or anything. One person, no, I don't understand. That's good. I like the honesty. So, you understand when we talk about gross impermanence, it's the greatest a cup. Smash the cup. Oh, my cup is broken. I, I have to get a new cup. Right? Okay. That's gross impermanence where the, the continuum of that object then stops. But subtle impermanence means things in and of themselves are changing moment by moment. And because of that, because of the subtle impermanence that's going on moment to moment, that is what allows actually gross impermanence to happen. So the fact we say, you know, in the four seals of the, the Buddhist teachings, right? Duche tamche mitakpa. 
okay, I know there's a, a few people learning Tibetan here. So, duche tangche ni takpa. Duche is compounded phenomena. Phenomena that arise due to causes and conditions. Tamche is all. Nitakpa, impermanent. So all phenomena that arise due to causes and conditions are impermanent. Now, the, the gross way of understanding that is, you know, the, the cup has come and eventually the cup will break. But the more subtle way is that even the cup is changing moment by moment. You know? On a subtle molecular level, the, you know, electron cloud, whatever, you know. Mm. So what I'm saying now, when we apply that, duche tamshe mitakpa, our afflictions are duche. They arise due to causing conditions. We're going to get into the causes and conditions in a little bit. But that means they are impermanent in nature. Means they're going to pass away without necessarily thinking we have to take a hammer to them. Okay? You understand? So part of what we're doing, what we're, I, I should say, what we're going to be doing as we expand this mindfulness practice, right? They normally talk about the four, well, some say four foundations of mindfulness, some say four close placements of mindfulness, but we have the mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of the mind, and mindfulness of phenomena, okay? Mm -hmm. So now, uh, we did just the body in this session, right? First, meditating on our body position, then the breath. Actually, those sensations, it's all in the body, right? So still in the body. What we're doing, focus on what's going on in the body, then just allow things to happen. Watching the breath, long breath, okay. Short breath, okay. Oh, maybe we can't feel the breath. That's also okay. Right? And just being aware of what's happening and kind of this, uh, what we say, an impartial observer. The other thing that we say is, uh, you know, using non judgmental awareness. So trying to break from this pattern of always judging things. Oh, long breath. Oh, long breath is good breath. Short breath, bad breath good, you know, always judging, always trying to <clears throat> label and, and have conceptual proliferation. So now here, later, we're going to even sort of loosen our focus of the breath. Uh, is it okay? I preview a little bit what we're gonna, where we're headed. Later, although we're saying now breath, we try to keep our, our home in the breath, our awareness in the breath. Later, we'll loosen and allow everything that's happening in our experience. That's okay. Sound? Okay, there's a sound. Uh, there's uh, hunger? Okay, there's hunger. You know, the feeling in the stomach. Oh, there's a memory? Okay, I watched that too. Anger? Irritation? Okay. I watch that, I watch that also without rejecting. Just letting, but, but also not to add fuel to it, just accepting that it arises, watching it, knowing it's there, not pushing away. So no pushing away, no aversion to the unpleasant, nor clinging to the pleasant, and remaining in this state of mind that uh, doesn't freak out, okay? So that in itself is gonna be a, a key 
tool in our arsenal against the afflictions. Yeah, because that one is going to be helpful for any of the afflictions uh, that may arise. Means not to engage, not to add conceptual baggage to it, but let it let it arise. Means not repressing, hmm? letting it arise, right? As um, hmm. as uh, the, the great uh, uh, teacher Mingyu Rinpoche, he has this analogy that I like very much, right? Where um, talking about a, a river, right? a river. And so many times, uh, especially when we're meditating or we start to meditate or we think we're starting to meditate <laughs> and we might have all these conceptual thoughts come up and we have this maybe a preconceived notion that, oh, when I meditate, it has to be blank, you know, blank slate, nothing, right? No thought. No thought is the best thought, right? Hmm. But then what happens? Actually, see, those of you who've studied Lorik, right? The mind, mind and awareness. The mind is what we call an object possessor, right? So an object possessor always has to have an object, right? So we always have something going on in the mind. So we can't stop it. In fact, if we try to stop, this is where the analogy of the river is, right? So one extreme, right? Uh, we get totally carried away by the river, you know? We, we jump in the river, it's going very fast. We get to totally carried away down the river. It's like what we were saying with the, the memory of our the, the person who wronged us in the past, get totally caught up in it. Oh, all of a sudden, we're, we're down the, the, the rapids of anger and thinking about revenge and all that. Mm. The one extreme. Other extreme, okay, I have to block everything. But what happens? We block the, the try to block the river. Well, we saw it in, in Northern India, you know, those, those dams breaking, right? When we block, then a lot of energy gets sort of repressed. Mm. So also not to block. So what do we do? Oh, wait a sec. What do we do? But well, we come out of the river onto the bank of the river and watch it, everything go by. That's the middle way. I found that uh, analogy very, very helpful. I hope you do too. Okay, we have a question here in the, the live the live studio audience. Yes, what's your name? Akina. Sakina. Sakina, okay. So my question is, I mean, you already covered it. It's just that if there is a case, like when you look at something and it dissolves, is that the same as like blocking it? Or is that just a brain? Yeah, yeah. So should, uh, Sakina was asking, if you look at it and it just dissolves, is that... Uh, the same as blocking it. So uh, no, if it is dissolving on its own, right? That's what we're supposed to do. So actually to, to the, the kind of uh, thought process, okay, we shouldn't be thinking so much actually about it, but the, the, the kind of overarching attitude is, right? That we're, we're aware, right? So non-judgmental awareness means we have to be aware first. So we're aware of what's going on in the mind, yeah? And we have a, a, a total openness to it. It's okay, Deep, deeply okay. Even the bad stuff, right? So even the anger arises, we don't push away, we don't, we don't reject. Now, on the bigger picture, of course we wanna be rid of anger, we want to, you know, be fully enlightened Buddhas, right? But in the process of this meditation, how it's working, we're building this, this skill where we're kind of unwinding our habitual habits, sorry, habitual habits, 
habitual tendencies to always be you know reacting so uh don't think there's anything that we need to do for it to go away but if it happens to go away we notice that too do you know what i mean um so maybe maybe the and why it's taught in the order of the, the the body mindfulness of the body and then feelings and the mind and phenomena right maybe it's easier to notice with a scratch right an itch on the face this you know happens a lot too right oh man uh, the, the the first uh, actual um place where i did a long longer retreat more intensive retreat was at a, a zen monastery and they're very 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 strict like don't move you know don't move for the entire session and so uh can i tell a story well we have time so one point you know i have allergies right and then uh you know i had a uh, allergy attack. I had a runny nose. And then, you know, my nose is a bit runny. So, you know, one time, a few minutes <laughs> go by, do it a second time. And the senior monk, he yells in the meditation hall, silence. Oh, jeez, man. Okay, and I'm like, all right, no more sniffles. So what ends up happening? Sorry, I hope it's not uh, dinner time for anyone. But you know, then my nose runs. It, it's, run it's slow, you know, it runs, okay, past my lips, and, and over the chin, down the neck. And you know, runny nose is very, very slow, right? It's like, you know, now I understand, okay, Chinese water torture, right? They just one drip, one drip, one drip. Whew, man. But I'm just made the, the kind of, um, how do you say? Determination that, okay, I'm not going to. Uh, you know, sniffle, I'm not going to move. And then what happens? Yeah, it was excruciating. After 40 minutes, the bell rung. Get up, wipe the face. It's over. Okay. That's all right, too. You know, it was unpleasant for those times. But uh, yeah, all things will pass, right? And so that's also an important uh, kind of realization. Uh, I mean, they say the analogy, right? The ocean, no matter how turbulent the water is, the waves, eventually the water just goes back into the ocean. There's nowhere for it to go. Uh, I just realized my story might not have had much to do with your question, <laughs> but I like it anyway. Uh, did I answer your question? Okay. All right. So, ooh, a little bit short on time, but that's what I wanted to mention about uh, kind of framing the, the context of, oh, Shanti, you had a question, right? Like, um, 
Okay, so um, uh, Shanti here had a. Uh, when I say we're not supposed to, you know, freak out, uh, asking a bit of clarity about that. Um, so, yeah, she brought up an example, like maybe there can be something very inspiring that we get kind of carried away with. And should we be trying to avoid that? Uh, was that your question? Yes. Yeah, intense emotion. Right. Okay. So a, a, a few things to mention, right? Um, one is, um, so this practice we're doing, uh, and it's a type of training, mental training, right? Uh, but with anything, right? There's a, a time for the training. There's a specific goal of the training, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, we uh, sort of do that all the time, right? Um, I remember one of my classmates uh, back in school, he was a basketball player and they have these special, they call them strength shoes, right? where it's um, kind of like the reverse of a high heel, where the, the front of the shoe has a big, um, like this, right? And, and then the heel, you know, there's nothing. So by walking around in those shoes, one uh, develops strength in the calf muscles, which can then help one jump higher, which if you're a basketball is a good, um, attribute, right? Okay, now, uh, you might wear those shoes for some amount of time, right? But um, not all the time. So when we describe in this meditation that we just observe things and not react, now, <laughs> when you're at home and you're eating dinner with your parents, and someone says, oh, can you pass the roti? You don't develop the same mindset. It'd be like, okay, just sound. I'm not going to react. Right? You pass the roti. You fulfill that being's, uh, you know, um, wishes. Right? So there's, in other words, we all know this, right? There's a time and a place for everything. Okay? Now, there's a time and a place where we are sitting down in formal meditation practice and we're developing this skill where we are taking control of the mind or trying to get rest a little bit control back where we're not such in a reactive mode okay but that's not then to say that there might not be other times when you know let's say right we're meditating on bodhicitta Okay, maybe we get very overwhelmed with compassion. We start crying uncontrollably. That could be a good thing to, to kind of let, let these positive emotions sort of fully blossom, right? And in, in, engage with it more, you know? Like we're, we're, we're saying, uh, okay, those negative emotions, we remember remember that person who wronged us 20 years ago, oh, they did this, 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 this. It gets full blown. Well, <laughs> a opposite kind of thing can happen when we meditate on compassion, right? All beings have been my mother. Oh my gosh, they were so kind to me in the past. Oh, I must repay their kindness. I'm so unable to do that right now. Oh, if I were to attain enlightenment, then I would be able to. Oh, gosh, that's what I got to do. Right? We let ourselves get carried away in, in that kind of situation. Right? 
You understand? Does that answer your question? May more of this meditation do what? Make our reactions and Uh, well, yes, hopefully it'll make our reactions more subdued because I think in general, <clears throat> well, I don't know about you, but, uh, I tend to be a little short fused, right? So I, I'm, I'm viewing that as a good thing to have my reactions more subdued, right? So this is the thing, right? Mindfulness on one level is, is awareness, right? Aware of what's going on, right? Aware of what's going on in our body, our mind. Aware, before we just, you know, blurt out those words to say, I have an intention to call this person a blank, right? Now, most of the time, you <laughs> see, because we're, we're so habituated with negativity, then our natural tendencies aren't towards the virtuous, but are towards the non-virtuous. And so to slow down those processes is actually a good thing, right? We're gonna talk about this more when we talk about you know, bigger habits, right? But you see, we want to kind of, um, okay, if we're trying to eat more healthy, right, what do we do? We make it more difficult to eat junk food and we make it more easy to eat uh, healthy food, right? So th those things that we identify as being, uh, you know, not conducive, negative, whatever you want to call them, we try to put more barriers in place so we don't do it. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, is that good? Can we go on? Okay, well, we have uh, 14 more minutes. So let's... Um, hmm. Yeah, okay, we can do a little bit and then we'll, we can, I guess, uh, finish the rest tomorrow. So hold on. I'm going to do a screen share for the people who are tuning in. Okay. Oops. Okay. So now uh, we're going to kind of put this uh, the serving emotions in the overall context of the laminar, okay? So those of you who haven't um, studied uh, much before, it's gonna be a little bit new, but just bear with me. So the lamrim, lam is path, rim is stages. And uh, basically the, the Buddhist teachings uh, have been categorized, systematized into stages of the path right literally the stages of the path that lead to enlightenment and so uh then mm, hmm, where does this uh topic of the disturbing emotions come in well in general there's three main sections of the the, the path and they call it the, the paths of the, the three types of being or the three types of practitioner. Kebu, sum. Yeah. Kebu is like a person. Sum is three. All right. So we have the, the, the persons of small capacity, the persons of medium capacity, and the persons of large capacity. And they are uh, kind of differentiated on the goal with which they undertake their practice. Since they have different goals for their practice, 
since they're trying to achieve different things, they then have to uh, practice different things to achieve at that goal, right? You can think of three kind of destinations. And if you, you know, three travelers have three diff different destinations, they might use different modes of transport. They, you know, are going different places. So uh, in brief, the person of a small capacity, their goal is to get a good rebirth in their next life. Therefore, they try to uh, abandon the causes of a bad rebirth, negative karma, and try to uh, accumulate the uh, causes of a good rebirth, positive karma. Okay. Then the person of middle capacity goes beyond that. Doesn't just want a good rebirth in the next life because, well, what about the one after that? Remember what we were saying? All the uh, impermanent or compounded phenomena are impermanent. So even a good rebirth in the next life is a compounded phenomenon that will also end. Mm. So they then uh, look to be free from this whole cycle of rebirth, samsara. Okay. Now, the cycle of samsara is sort of um, fueled by karma and the afflictions, the disturbing emotions. So from a Buddhist perspective, why I said at the very beginning of this, that on one level, all of the Buddhist teachings are about um, you know, healing or defeating, or getting rid of the disturbing emotions, is because the disturbing emotions are the primary cause for samsara. And in, to put it another way, is the primary cause of all of our suffering. And remember our deep mm, sort of wish, aspiration, drive to be free from suffering. So because that is there, because we want to be free from suffering, we want to be free from the cause of suffering. And therefore we need to be free of these disturbing emotions. So, here, uh, just giving the context and the overall uh, path, right? So this is the middle capable being, the person of medium capacity who wants liberation from samsara. What do they have to do? They have to abandon the causes of samsara. What are the causes of samsara? Karma and afflictions. Of the karma and afflictions, which, which is more important? The afflictions. Uh, and here we don't have to get into all the kind of arguments, but at the very least, you should know that, uh, let's say, even if someone were to uh, uh, purify all their karma, if they have the afflictions, in the very next moment, they'll accumulate more karma. And all it takes is one to, to project us into a next rebirth. And in that next rebirth, we'll accumulate more. And that, that's why samsara is beginningless, they say. And also, unless we uproot the afflictions, our future samsara will also be endless. I don't know which one is worse. Okay. So, uh, then here, training the mind in the stage of the path, shared with Pitam persons of medium capacity we have the mental training identifying the mind intent on liberation right so we have liberation liberation from what samsara so the mind intent on liberation means the mind that sets as its goal freedom from samsara okay so then uh b and those of you who can't see the screen i'm just going through the lamarum outlines b is the method for developing this mind intent on liberation. How do we do that? We reflect on suffering and its origin. Origin, or in other words, causes. So, you know, in the Four Noble Truths, yes, Four Noble Truths, truth of suffering, truth of the cause of suffering. The very first teaching of the Buddha in, uh, you know, Saranath, he taught the Four Noble Truths. 
and in that order. First, the, the truth of suffering, that our experience living as unenlightened beings as we do, then is characterized by various types of dissatisfaction, pain, hmm? undesirable. Uh, here, putting it in the faults of psychic existence, the drawbacks, the bad stuff. And then the, the second point is the reflection on the process of psychic existence in terms of its origin. Okay. So origin, or we can, we can say causes, right? And then that's the, the, the main body of what we're going to be talking about. Well, now it's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, so the reflection on the process of psychic existence in terms of its origin, then we're going to uh, know how the afflictions arise. So identifying the afflictions, uh, the order in which the afflictions arise, the causes of the afflictions, and the faults of the afflictions. Okay. So in those four, uh, we're going to go through those in uh, greater detail tomorrow, and then also equip you to then, um, you know, deal with, deal with them. Okay. But our time is, uh, yeah, running short. So I wanted to just open it up uh, again for any questions. And maybe our, our friends who are on Zoom, maybe they feel left out. Maybe they feel um, uh, envy, envy, maybe, for all those who are here who get to ask questions. So we can open up for people on, on the Zoom or if people in the studio audience have questions, they can do it too. Okay. Yeah. There's no stupid questions, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> you have a very pure view. Okay, so we got a question. She says, based on all of my knowledge, then have I overcome most of these things and I am I living uh, happily most of the time? So, um, unfortunately, well, one is the, the, the first premise of the question I, I also reject with all of my language. I'm not very knowledgeable. That's first. Uh, secondly, um, unfortunately, see, to overcome means to abandon. And that is going to come at a very high level of development. Actually, uh, really to overcome means to attain nirvana, okay? And that is a, uh, a huge undertaking. So uh, I will say, you know, uh, practice incrementally over a long period of time, you do see some uh, changes. In fact, if you're not seeing, I, I mean positive changes, in fact, if you're not seeing uh, progress, then you might have to reconsider how you practice. But it, it, it will take time with any uh, kind of skill you're trying to learn, any kind of habit you're trying to uh, inculcate, or any change you're trying to make. It's not going to happen quickly. It might not happen very easily. But... Uh, over a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, even they say the Buddha was, was just like us, right? No Buddha was inherently kind of pure from the start. They all had afflictions like we have and went through the process and was able to, were able to abandon them. Okay. We have a, 
couple of questions on the Zoom chat. Mindfulness of phenomena, can you briefly explain? Okay. So, yeah. Um, so basically, right, we have uh, those four categories. We have the body, feelings, mind, and phenomena. So phenomena actually just is a catch-all for anything that doesn't in, uh, fit in the other three categories. Okay. Now, the, the important ones for us are impermanence, selflessness, right? These other concepts that you, you might have heard of in uh, you know, other lectures you might have uh, been to. Yeah, so that's a brief explanation of phenomena. It's a catch-all for things that are in the, the first three categories. Then we have another question uh, on the Zoom. I don't understand the analogy leading to impermanence. What about persistent dreams or goals that last throughout life? In which way are those going to end besides, of course, in death? Okay, so you see hmm, here, uh, it's like this. Let, let, let's make it even very simple, right? I have a glass of water in my hand. I have an eye consciousness perceiving the glass of water, okay? Now that eye consciousness perceiving the glass of water, there's moment one, moment two, moment three, moment four, so forth, okay? So it has on one level, the same object. They're all, all five moments are uh, perceiving the glass of water, but nonetheless, there is impermanence. The first moment of the eye consciousness perceiving the water is the cause of the second moment, and that is the cause of the third moment. At the time of the third moment, the second moment has gone away, okay? So now when you talk about a persistent dream or goal that you have throughout life, let's say you have the mind of bodhicitta and you wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sinning beings, and you are uh, you know, 30 years old now, so you have a bodhicitta in the mind of a 30-year-old man. Congratulations. Okay. Then later, uh, you know, when you're 40, if you haven't given up bodhicitta, double congratulations. But that mind of bodhicitta that you have in, in your 40-year-old continuum is different than the, the um, one in the 30-year-old. It's within a continuum right but the and and we can say the the 30 year old uh the 30 year old's bodhicitta is the cause of the 40 year old's bodhicitta but they're not the same and therefore they're impermanent so that's what i mean it doesn't mean then like the cup shattering and breaking that if you have the goal of bodhicitta it's going to disintegrate and won't have it anymore but it, at the very least, is going to give rise to the second moment. And this is what we were talking about with, with subtle impermanence. The first moment of the cup gives rise to the second moment of the cup. Like that. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So, um, thank you very much. This was uh, really nice. Can I say that? No clinging to the pleasant. But see, we notice. If it's pleasant, we can say, yeah, that was nice. That was good food. No problem. It was a nice class. It was good weather. Now, I'm not fishing for compliments. I'm just saying. See, so that's another thing, right? Sometimes people can get a little bit um, confusion, right? Again. There's a time and place for everything. It's not that through our meditation practice, we become like robots, you know, you know, emotion does not compute or something like this, right? We still appreciate goodness. We appreciate beauty, right? We're aware. That's the conventional reality. We're not denying conventional reality. These things exist. Okay. So... 
let us uh, end the session. Just like at the beginning of the session, we had a, a positive motivation, right? At the end of the session, what, we, what do we do? We dedicate our positive energy that we've created in our time together so that, well, best would be we dedicate in line with our motivation. What was our motivation? To develop ourselves, develop our good qualities, to abandon our negative qualities so we can be of our most benefit of all sentient beings. Okay, so due to the merit that we've uh, accumulated in our time here today, may we, uh, you know, have all the conducive conditions and have success in our practice to transform our minds so we can quickly achieve enlightenment to be of utmost benefit of all sentient beings. And then, hmm, that very mind of bodhicitta we were talking about, or no, we weren't talking about it. <laughs> we should talk about it. This, this, this altruistic wish to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, just as we had a glimmer of it in the beginning of our class, right? Then may all the beings, all the beings in the whole universe have that kind of aspiration as well, rooted in deep fundamental compassion toward all sinning beings, not wishing to cause even the slightest harm to a single sinning being and only being of utmost benefit. So may that kind of mind arise in everyone's heart right now. And then if one has already generated a little glimmer of that, may that never decline, but increase more and more. And then all the uh, various uh, acute causes of suffering in the world, uh, may they instantly uh, disappear. So all the suffering due to a war, all the suffering due to natural disasters, all the suffering due to various economic problems, all the suffering due to uh, uh, disease, illness, and all that. May those uh, instantly disappear from the universe. Okay, so thank you very much. We have uh, our next session tomorrow, 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. So that's going to be in uh, 14 and a half hours. Okay. So thank you very much. Ha. Huh. Okay, I got a, a, a question uh, direct to me and uh, we're out of time, but I will take down that question and we'll talk about it tomorrow, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, thank you.